we have scaled it up. Uh, and so we, you know, depending on what you think crypto is worth, we manage somewhere between zero and $2 billion, sort of the joke I always tell. You know, if you ask Warren Buffett, he'll, he'll say it's probably zero. And, uh, you know, if you look at our accounting statements, it's, you know, a couple billion dollars. This content is brought to you by Uphold, which is one of the top crypto platforms out there, which allows you to easily buy, sell, trade Bitcoin and the top altcoins in the market. Uphold lists 260 plus cryptocurrencies. They also allow you to trade precious metals such as gold, silver, palladium, and platinum. I've been a user of Uphold since 2018, so I can vouch for this platform. They have full transparency reports and they don't commingle or lend out your funds. They also have a great product called Vault, which is an assisted self-custody product. A Vault allows you to maintain custody of your funds and the keys are split. So Uphold holds one and you hold two. And if there's any issues, if you lose one of your keys, Uphold will help restore these uh, keys and you can maintain uh, access to your funds. It's 24 seven instant trading, it's trustless. So this is a great feature that uh, can give you peace of mind where you don't have to worry about if you lose your private keys and much more. Uh, so if you'd like to learn more about Uphold, please visit the link in the description. Welcome into the Thinking Crypto Podcast. I'm your host, Tony Edward. And with me today is Avichal Garg, who's the co-founder and general partner on the investment team at Electric Capital. Avichal, great to have you on. Good to see you. Thanks for having me. Avichal, I've followed Electric Capital over the years. I've watched the number of funding raises that you guys have done and, um, and who you've had on your advisory board, what's on your portfolio. So I'm really excited to speak with you and get to learn more. Uh, but let's start with your background. Where are you from and what's okay. your professional background? Um, well, I'll start at the very beginning. I was, uh, I was born in India. Uh, I grew up mostly in the Midwest in the United States. Uh, went to Stanford for undergrad and grad school and uh, then had a career in tech. Um, worked at Google, worked on search ranking and ads ranking, uh, started and sold two companies, the second one at Facebook, and then um, ran some teams at Facebook and learned a bunch. And uh, in about 2015, uh, started uh, angel investing and was in, uh, very fortunate. I got, I got involved with a bunch of companies that have done well over the years. Um, a lot of sort of up the middle SaaS and productivity and fintech comes companies. So things like Notion and Figma and Airtable and uh, Deal and a bunch of great Avon, a bunch of great companies in that sort of traditional world. And then I was doing a lot of frontier tech investing. So things like self-driving cars, um, supersonic airplanes and crypto. Uh, and uh, increasingly spending time on the crypto side, uh, my co-founder Curtis, uh, my co-founder at Electric, and he's my co-founder at, uh, at the startup that we sold to Facebook, um, we thought we'd start another company. And, and so when we're thinking about where to spend time, we were spending a lot of time in AI and we we're spending a lot of time in crypto in uh, 2016. We have, uh, have a machine learning background, so that oh, yeah. that world is sort of familiar to me. Um, and as we thought about it more and more, kind of the, the thing that we came to believe was that the AI stuff will be very impactful, like it would have a huge, huge impact, uh, and, and obviously, uh, I think at this point. Um, the thing that we weren't so sure about was what would the implications be in terms of who really benefited and who really won. And so kind of as, as startup people, the thing that we were thinking about was, is there some structural advantage for the startups? Um, and can they really win? And our thinking on the AI stuff was there will be lots of interesting startups, but the people who have lots of data and who have lots of compute are at such an advantage yeah. that it wasn't clear to us that it would be quite disruptive in the same way that say the internet was. And what struck us about crypto was it felt like a fundamentally different way to think about uh, software and data uh, and money and capital markets and so different that it almost was not being taken seriously. This was in 2016. And when we looked at it, we said, actually, this is really interesting because we think the technology is real and is on a path to, to getting better and better over time. But most people are not taking it seriously enough. They don't really understand it that deeply. Mm -hmm. And if this stuff works, it's such a different way to build software 
that the incumbents will actually be at a strategic and structural disadvantage. Like, mm-hmm. you know, re-architecting your systems to be privacy first or to use uh, distributed data storage um, or to um, use, you know, uh, a USD stable coin instead of using the legacy payment rails. Like these things these are, are actually pretty fundamental changes to how a business works. Right. And so our thinking was a lot of the legacy businesses would not be set up to make that transition. And that's actually more fertile ground from a startup perspective. So the, the analogy here might be something like, um, you know, the internet was so fundamentally disruptive, like very few non-internet native businesses were able to make the transition. So yeah. most of the media companies got disrupted, for example. Um, a lot of like traditional retailers got disrupted by e um, and they weren't able to make the transition. Um, if you look at mobile, um, a lot of the legacy software businesses were actually able to make the transition to mobile. Like Facebook moved to mobile and did fine. Google moved to mobile and did fine. Um, Apple was able to move to mobile and do fine. Um, that's not to say there weren't new things like Uber or something created Instagram, but but many legacy businesses actually Airbnb they were able to sort of move over to mobile and it, and it was okay. It sort of accelerated their business in a lot of ways. Um, and so that's kind of how we thought about it. It's like the, the crypto stuff to us felt a lot more like the internet and the AI stuff felt a lot like mobile, um, both obviously huge impact, but the internet was very fundamentally di- disruptive in a different way, in my opinion. And so we said, that's really interesting. We should spend time there. And as we spent more and more time there, we realized that actually um, there was an opportunity to build a new type of investment firm that looked kind of like a VC firm, but was built differently and worked with founders differently and created value in the world differently. I mean, we could talk about that. Um, mm-hmm. So we set to create that. And uh, in t- 2018, we formalized that into electric capital. And then th- these days we, um, we have scaled it up. Uh, and so we, you know, depending on what you think crypto is worth, we manage somewhere between zero and $2 billion, sort of the joke I always tell, mm-hmm. you know, if you ask Warren Buffett, he'll, he'll say it's probably zero. And, uh, you know, if you look at our accounting statements, it's, you know, a couple billion dollars. Um, and so, you know, we invest in, um, uh, you know, launch token networks, we invest in, in equity businesses. Um, we primarily do seed and series A, so we're early stage, um, sort of first check-in kinds of investors. Um, but given that we've done this for a few years now, we have, you know, the portfolio has matured and some of the companies that we work with, you know, like Bitnomial or Bitwise or, um, you know, or, or they started very, very small and now they're, you know large billion dollar plus kinds of companies. And so um, the portfolio is, you know, the, the people that we work with is, is um, evolved quite a bit, but kind of the core of what we do is find early stage founders and give them money and help them build stuff. For sure. And congrats on the success. Um, a follow-up question on the AI uh, and blockchain relationship item. Um, you know, I see them being symbiotic. I don't know if you agree where mm-hmm. uh, blockchain can be used to help validate some AI things like deep fakes and so forth. And AI can be used on top of blockchains to enhance certain attributes. Um, do uh, First question, do you agree with that? And second, are you looking at any AI themed blockchains, whether it be near or render and so forth? Um, uh, short answer, yes, I agree. Um, I think um, these two worlds converge. They're, they're two sides of the same coin as, as um, sort of you're getting at, which is, you know, AI in a lot of ways, I think gives us digital abundance. Mm-hmm. And so the cost of creating content, for example, goes to zero. Uh, and what cryptography really gets you is digital scarcity and provenance. And so I can prove to you that I did a thing with a cryptographic proof. Um, and and that's the other side of it. And so, for example, if you're uh, Joe Biden or Donald Trump and you're running for president, you may need to issue videos uh, that are provably not deep fakes. And, and the way you would do that is you would issue a cryptographic uh, hash alongside the video um that that asserts that you in fact did create that and, and all of that cryptography and technology exists today so yes they're definitely complementary now there's this new flavor of um uh uh sort of blockchain plus ai and i think some of that stuff is very real so we're, we were seed investors in near in 2018 and Ilya and alex are, are good friends of ours and so i think a lot of the work that the near ecosystem is doing is very real um those guys are spending a lot of time thinking about for example what does uh, a developer AGI look like? Like, can you create an AI that can write code? Um, because if you could do that, then you would unlock a lot of other things. Um, and so that that work that they're doing, I think is very real. I mean, I- I- Ilya, for those of you who don't know, this is not um, 
OpenAI Ilya, this is a different Ilya, but this Ilya, Polosukin, Ilya P was on the um, Attention is All You Need Transformer paper that kicked off LLMs, like it's a fundamental underpinning. So he's, he's an author on, on the paper that created LLMs ultimately. Uh, so very smart guy, really knows his stuff. And um, so, you know, I think the work that they're doing is very real. I think a lot of other uh, AI crypto projects right now are basically vaporware. Like if you, if you sort of look through, it's like, there's no real usage. Nobody's actually using them. Mm. Unclear if anybody would use them. It's unclear what their competitive advantage is. Um, so it's a little bit reminiscent, I think, of maybe the ICO boom in sure. 2017, which is the ideas are probably right. It's early for that stuff to really work. But, you know, by 2022, 2023, a lot of the ideas from the 17 ICO boom um, and that speculative mania, they, they were basically the right ideas. There's a lot of DeFi ideas or things like stable coins. There were things like, um, you know, non-custodial DEXs or things like, um, you know, ex separate execution environments like L2s. And, you know, some of those ideas were being kicked around in 17, 18, and they just didn't come to fruition until 23. So... I think a lot of the ideas are right, but they're probably five years too early. Um, and 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 that's sort of an environment where there's a lot of um, speculative energy uh, can can be a little bit dangerous. So we generally are wary of things that are sort of sitting at the intersection of crypto and AI right now. Um, but I think like twenty percent of that stuff is very real. Mm. Um, given your Web two experience, right, working at Google, working at Facebook. What are you hearing and seeing as far as those companies looking to transition to Web3? It seems it's been a bit slow. There's talks of them testing things, uh, mm -hmm. investing you know, on their venture arms and so forth. Um, and do you think there's going to be a tipping point or you know, maybe in five years or so that they, okay, oh man, we need to get on board because we're getting left behind? Um, it's, a, it's an excellent question. I think there will be a moment that a lot of Web2 companies look around and say, oh, we're way behind. Mm -hmm. Not that dissimilar from, let's say, media companies in the 90s not really understanding the internet. And then when YouTube and Facebook happened and social media happened, they sort of said, oh, no, we've been left behind. What now? Um, but by then it was too late. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there's sort of, is it, it maybe a different way to ask that question or sort of an angle on that question is, who are the companies that sort of seem to get it and like what categories do they fall into? And in addition to startups that are sort of native to the space, I think um, you are seeing companies like Stripe and Visa, um, sort of financial infrastructure companies that seem to get this because they look at it and they say, oh, this actually, the ability to move money 24 seven and write code around money makes a lot of sense. Mm. And so for those folks, like the notion of a stable coin um, is, is very natural. They get it. Um, and they're good engineering teams, and so they understand it. Um, I think the the second category of people that seem to sort of understand this are some of the the traditional finance people. So folks like BlackRock or Fidelity. So you have the crypto natives like Bitwise, uh, which is a portfolio company, but then you have um, and they're the largest index fund uh, ETF provider in crypto. Uh, but and then you have companies like BlackRock, which are legacy TradFi companies. Um, and some of those guys get it. So I think TradFi, which has had to deal with like the guts of really terrible financial infrastructure for the last 30, 40, 50 years, a lot of those folks get it. And they're like, oh, this is just better infrastructure to do what we already do. Um, and then when you look outside the US, when you look in the developing markets, you see a lot of companies that get it. And it's because they deal with a lot of day-to-day -day problems that this technology yeah. solves, like the ability to move money around 24 seven or to get access to US dollars or um, to have, um, you know, non-custodial sorts of arrangements where maybe you don't trust your counterparties. Like a lot of the problems that these technologies solve, uh, people internationally, like here in Southeast Asia or Latin America, you, you deal with these kinds of problems every day. And so those businesses seem to understand it um, and, are, and are sort of crypto native. And in, in, in those markets, often you, you actually don't even see necessarily a, uh, a distinction between Web 2 and Web 3. Like you might just be a fintech company yeah. that happens to use much crypto and behind the scenes and you don't even mention it um or, or you might be like some healthcare company and you just happen to use distributed systems off the shelf like maybe you, use, you pull like the cosmos sdk off the shelf and use tendermint um and, and it's just because it solves a problem for you so you don't even you don't even mention that you're a crypto company so it's interesting that internationally you see a lot of companies just solving problems just using the infrastructure um uh but there's a lot of baggage in the united states i think around this stuff uh, and in part because so much of, so many of our systems work you know and like there's yeah. you can get a you can get a bank account you can get an api we have stripe we have plaid like the infrastructure is like decent to do a lot of things and so the, the companies here often are 
they think of themselves as Web two or Web three, and internationally, we don't, we we actually don't see as much of a distinction. Mm, yeah, that definitely makes sense. Now you mentioned Electric Capital has about two billion of assets under management. Um, tell us if you can. Uh, how much of is it is it 50 50 some are into companies building the infrastructure kind of the picks and shovels and the other half of the capital is into tokens and things like that uh good question um well and and, and it goes without saying but maybe it's worth saying obviously none of this is financial advice and you should not listen to anything i say uh in, in practice, it's a little hard to answer that question. And, and the reason is because the numbers change every day. So anything like we, we own a bunch of Bitcoin and Ethereum, for example, mm -hmm. and the price of that moves like a lot on any given day, it might move five or 10%. So that, that ratio might move a lot. Uh, the other reason it's a little tricky is I think um, tokens versus equity is not necessarily even, that's often not how we think about it um, because you know, even with the tokens um, that we may invest in, often we're we're locked up for multiple years um, sure. because we're we're venture investors, and so the way we think about it is how do we how do we think about this playing out over the next five to ten years? And and in those kinds of situations, often you can create alignment between the investors and and the protocol if you're willing to lock up. Um, mm -hmm. And so most of our stuff is actually locked up. So it might be a token uh, in terms of an instrument, um, but for all intents and purposes, it behaves exactly like. It. Uh, our equity investments in, in so much as it's locked up. Um, so we, we, you know, I think usually when people think tokens, they think it's like a thing you're trading or moving in and out of. Sure. Um, and we just, we just don't do that. So actually at the portfolio level, that distinction, uh, the, the other thing that's sort of tricky about that distinction is sometimes you may end up in situations like, you know, we don't hold um, uh, any, any B and B, um, but maybe let's use that as an example. You could imagine that Binance, the, the equity business issued BNB and Binance has on its books some BNB and maybe some some of the equity holders of Binance receive some some Binance token as a distribution for being equity holders. So I think increasingly you're going to see companies that start as a company realize that there's some sort of token network they could be launching that is very beneficial to the ecosystem and allows them to accelerate their business. You as an investor may have had exposure to the equity initially because that's what you invested in, but you also get exposure to the tokens. And so actually it's not even 50 50 like in some sense it's the 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 assets allocated will be greater than 100 percent because some of your investments will have equity that also issue tokens um so anyway all that says it's kind of nuanced um and it fluctuates on any given day um but the mindset that we have in any of the investments that we make is we want to hold this thing for 10 years that's how we think about it mm. And on that note, you know, you were an angel investor you invested in different well, companies outside of the crypto industry is there any major difference, maybe aside from tokens, that stands out to you? Uh, is is are, is it more challenging? You know, anything you can share there? Yeah, there, I think there's a lot. Um, you know, I think the global nature of this market is really interesting. Um, you know, you're you're dealing with customers all over the world from day zero. Um, I think the token network aspect of it can um, create distorting effects because you have you may have to deal with competitors that are willing to launch some token and, and do sort of short-term optimized things that allow them to acquire a bunch of customers um, and then you have to compete against that. Um, there's tremendous market volatility. So there's a cyclicality in the crypto cycle, roughly a four-year cycle. Um, and as a, result, as a result of that cycle, you have to, you, you, I think you have to be a better operator. So if you look at somebody like Brian um, at Coinbase, uh, Brian Armstrong, um, it's such a tough business to run, right? Because your your revenue might might go up five x, and then it might come back sixty percent, and then it might go up another five x. And so the volatility in your business means you have to be really smart about how, about how you manage your balance sheet. You have to be really smart about how you incentivize your employees. So how do comp packages work, for example? When do you re up people, and how much? And so so it actually introduces complexity into the business. But I think as a result, the founders who are successful here, I think if you will get Brian Armstrong, if you look at uh, Jeremy Lair at Circle, if you look at Jesse at Kraken, um, you know, Joe at um, Joe Lubin at Consensus, I think you just end up having to be a better founder. Um, and so if you look at a lot of the things, for example, that Coinbase has done over the last few years, because they're dealing with such a degree of difficulty um, relative to a lot of the other businesses, you know, after 2021, when, when the markets really changed, um, for let's say SaaS businesses or marketplace businesses, a lot of people really struggled. Like there were a lot of companies that were like, I've never done a layoff. How do I do a layoff? Mm -hmm. um, I've never had to manage my balance sheet. I've never had to have investors 
that are worried about my revenue going down. I've never had to think about how to reprice my options. All of those things were things that crypto companies had had to think about for years because of the market volatility. And so they were ready for it. So when the market downturn, the broader macro venture downturn happened in 21, I think crypto companies were were far better equipped to handle what was happening than anybody else because they just have to do that every four years. Um, yeah. So I think it, it net net actually makes for better founders because you're dealing with a greater degree of difficulty. Mm. Yeah, I can't imagine dealing with that volatility and the faster pace, I guess, of the markets because yeah. I don't think I've seen anything move like crypto. Yeah, yeah, it's wild. Um, now tell us about the type of clients that work with you. Is it high net worth individuals? Is it institutional investors? Um, primarily institutional. So our, our capital base, the, the folks that give us money um, for our funds are almost entirely U.S. university endowments, large nonprofits, and so on. So that's that's the overwhelming majority of our capital. We do have some um, high net worths um, in in the in the funds. Um, those are usually people that supported us very very early, in 2018, and we sort of brought along as, as a gesture of thanks um, for supporting us early. Um, and then a number of our founders are also um, involved uh, as investors in our funds, and so we do that very deliberately um, and uh, and sort of create an ecosystem uh, around the firm by by having founders involved as well. Um, but but on a dollar weighted basis, it's almost entirely at this point U.S. university endowments and large nonprofits and healthcare foundations and, and folks like that. I would love if you can take us behind the curtain in pitching those folks because, <laughs> you know, they, I, I I would love to be a fly in the wall to ta tell yeah. them about Bitcoin because you know there is certainly a stigma that has been around for a long time. I mean, go back to 2018. Larry Fink of BlackRock was saying Bitcoin yeah. was an avenue for money laundering. Now he's all in. They have an yeah. ETF. So certainly a 180 from him, but I can't imagine folks who are not paying attention to this at endowments and these places. How do you get them to feel confident and to give you money? That's a it's a good question. Um, you know, I think we really benefited by being able to have warm intros. Um, this wasn't by design, but in our very first fund, which was very small, it was a $16 million fund. Um, a lot of the people that gave us money were people that had worked with us in the past or had had known about our track record as angel investors or our, our startup track record. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was folks like um, Eilat Gill, uh, Chris Dixon and Mark Andreessen, um, uh, Heymont, uh, uh, Taneja over at uh, General Catalyst, uh, Joe Lonsdale over at 8VC, like people that we'd known for a long time or had, you know, we'd worked with in some capacity, gave us a little bit of money to get going. And as a side effect of that, it turns out if you look at those people's businesses like Andreessen Horowitz, A16Z or General Catalyst, these guys raised billions of dollars. And so their capital base is very institutional. And so they, um, you know, they're, they're trusted advisors to a lot of these institutions. So as we were getting out the ground um, and with our first fund, um, if there were ever an endowment that um, had questions about crypto, we, we started getting inbounds. We started, you know, mm -hmm. Joe would send us people, Elad would send us people, Hamon would send us people, and they just say, hey, if you're trying to understand this crypto thing in 2017, 2018, as the markets are going crazy, Go talk to a virtual and Curtis. They're they're really thoughtful about this stuff. Mm -hmm. And our approach with these conversations always was: we're not trying to sell you. We're not trying to convince you of anything. We'll meet you where you are. Like, tell us what questions you have, and we'll tell you how we thought about it. We'll tell you why we are so excited about this. We'll tell you how we think about the technology. And I think one of the lessons here is probably that if if you're not trying to sell anybody, you're just sort of stating facts, and you're just like, here's how I think about the world. It's very honest. And I think, especially for people who are pitched all the time, sure. uh, this is a good lesson for founders too, I think. Um, if you just sort of say like, here's what I believe, here's why I believe it, here's my thought process, and you just sort of lay that out in, in an intellectually honest way, um, even if the other person doesn't get to the same conclusion as you, they, they walk out of that conversation saying, oh, that's an intellectually honest person, and that's a trustworthy person. And then over time, if they start to, to see the data points and, and, and you said, hey, look, I think the world's going to work this way and here's why. And let me explain to you why I think the money printing has to happen. Like politically, there's no telling the solution. we got to print more money. We're going to cut rates. Or let me tell you why the successive pools of capital inside the Bitcoin ecosystem will fall. Like, yes, it's starting with alternate head net worth, but like once the endowments get off zero, all the endowments will come in. And if the endowments come in, then all of a sudden the, um, the pension funds have to start considering it. And if the pension funds... Uh, consider it the ETF tips one day. And once the ETF tips, then, you know, the black rocks of the world are. So you can lay out sort of what you think is going to happen. And then as those things start to happen, you start to accrue credibility or you can walk people through the technology and say, actually, let me like walk you through why this tech is really interesting. And let me show you the data 
know, we do this annual developer report. Um, that actually came out of these conversations because we would talk to all these people and, and we were explaining to them why we had some such conviction in space. And one of the things that gave us a lot of conviction is we could see folks like um, Vitalik or um, Zuko or you know, so many engineers from from kind of like this 16, 17, 18 era, guys like Ilya that were starting projects. Um, and so many of those seed investments that we made back then, if you just went and talked to those engineers, you 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 immediately walked out of the conversation saying, wow, this is a brilliant person, like technically brilliant person, and they're choosing to spend their time on this. Um, and so our thought was in, in 2018, well, how do we quantify that? Like, yeah, we have a bunch of one-off conversations with these technically brilliant people, but how many such people are there? And can, can we quantify that? And so Curtis built this crawling system to go crawl GitHub and GitLab and a bunch of websites and mm. started trying to quantify how many developers there are in the ecosystem, which turned into the annual developer report that we do. Wow. Um, but again, that, that was sort of from this perspective of like, we think developers are leading signal for where value will accrue over time because if developers are willing to commit their time to the thing, um, they'll create value. Um, and that came out of this conversation. So a lot of our approach with, with the institutions always has been and continues to be, we're not going to try to convince you of anything. Because I think if you convince people, if you try to convince people of stuff and you try to sell them on it, um, if it turns out they're not there, then six months in, they're going to have buyer's remorse, right? They're going to feel like you sold them on something. Sure. Whereas I think if you just lay out the facts and you're like, I'm not trying to convince you of anything. Let me just give you the facts. Let me show you the data. You decide. And then the decision is theirs. I think the psychology of that is very different because then they had to get there themselves. Um, and in our opinion, like if you lay out the facts, then smart people will come to the right conclusion. Um, and so that approach has worked really well for us. Um, and I think it's a very collaborative approach and it continues to be how we think about it today. And so, um, I don't know, I frankly, you know, I, I always, we always talk about this internally. I've never worked at a venture fund. Curtis has never worked at a venture fund. So it is not clear to us that this is actually how venture funds operate. <laughs> this sure. just happens to be how, how we operate. Right. And, and it's sort of our approach to it. Um, and you know, it's, it seems to have worked well for us. Um, I'm curious with the influx of Wall Street and launching ETS, BlackRock, Fidelity, all these big names, has that given more or has that generated more demand from these folks? Has it made your pitch easier because there's mm. like social proof? Yeah. Um, short answer is yes. I think that um, especially because because like kind of what you were saying, right? I mean, if you go back to 2018, um, Larry Fink was, was anti this stuff. And then you can see there's like these really amazing CNBC clips of of him evolving his thinking over a few years and getting to where he is. Um, and I think when the world's largest asset manager, you know, the CEO of that organization is making these kind of statements, it's very hard for other people to sit up and say, it's a, it's a total scam, right? And so there's a very, very important moment, I think once BlackRock sort of tipped and once Larry Fink tipped. Um, and, and we kind of saw this with the endowments too. He's, you know, it's like, when everybody is at zero allocation on a thing, it's, it's, it's sort of like an interesting human psychology thing, I think, to understand. When everybody was at zero in crypto, like no endowments had gone in, um, every chief investment officer, every CIO could look around and they didn't have to justify their zero. Like you didn't have to justify to your board why you were at 0% crypto allocation because everybody else was at zero. Right. Now, as soon as one or two of the really high quality people tip in, you as an organization, your board is going to say, wait a second, why is Harvard in? Why is Yale in? Why is MIT in? And we're not. Now you have to justify your zero. Um, and once you start looking at the facts, it becomes very hard to justify the zero. So this act of like one or two or three really credible people, like a BlackRock or Fidelity, moving off of zero um, and bringing a bunch of people along forces the question for everybody else. So it's not just that like the money that they bring in, it's actually creates this downstream second order effect where now Vanguard has to justify being on zero. And, and all of a sudden, once you start looking at it on, on the basis of the data and the facts, it becomes very hard to justify a zero. Like, well, maybe we should have 10 bips. Maybe we should have 25 bips. Uh, you know, like half a percent of the portfolio should be in this stuff. That doesn't seem crazy. Like if you lose half a percent of the portfolio, but if it really works, and you add five percent or ten percent to your net worth because this stuff really out, you know, performed. That's a pretty good risk reward, right? So it sort of forces the question. Um, and so I think the BlackRock moment was actually really important, um, not in so much for like how much money they'll bring into Bitcoin ETFs. Like I think that's that's not really the point, in my opinion. 
the really interesting thing is it forces a conversation for all of the asset managers in the world now for like, wait a second, why are we on zero? Why do we not have a crypto strategy? Is that the right thing for our clients? And, and now you have to start trying to justify your zero. And it turns out justifying being on zero is very hard. Yeah, because they have a fiduciary duty. And in addition, there's a bit of game theory, right? And no one wants to get left behind. Exactly. Um, yeah, so it's it's fascinating. And and in your pitch, are you talking to them about macro factors as well, given that mm -hmm. Bitcoin has been the, the best performing asset, uh, bonds are not doing well? In, in just looking at the trajectory of the out, uh, outlook of the markets and different assets, it's like you, you're almost forced to, like if you want to have a reasonable yeah. return, you have to go to crypto. Yeah. We, we So it depends a lot on who we're speaking with. So some firms are, you know, some, some asset managers, some LPs are very top-down macro oriented. And so they do think about things like track record and you look at the last 10 or 15 years of performance history. They think about things like, well, fixed supply assets and interest rates, um, and supply and demand and liquidity. Um, they think about things like inflation. So there's, there's absolutely a set of capital allocators in the world that are very sort of top-down macro where the money flows and currency exchange rates and interest rates and inflation, that's what ultimately drives the world. Um, there's a different set of people who are a little bit more bottom up uh, rather than top down. And their worldview is much more um, technical and technology breakthroughs create new use cases and those use cases create new markets. Um, and that's really where you have outsized returns. Um, and of course, those are impacted by capital flows because you know risk, risk capital needs to drive this innovation. But um, they care much more about um, what can you do with this stuff. So, for example, in the first category, you may get a lot of people that are open to doing um, investments in commodities or gold because they look at these sort of as driven by liquidity and macro effects. And those people think about perhaps Bitcoin in a particular way. Mm. Uh, and the second category is a, there's a lot of people in the world that actually don't own gold in their portfolio. They think it's a non-productive asset and it's speculative and like, what is it really worth? Yada, yada. Um, uh, but they're very right now into like AI. Um, and so a part of part of the job for us is um, understanding how where people are and what their mental models of the world are and how they think about it um, and and trying to explain to them what's happening sort of given that context so that they can understand it. So it's, it's almost like you're a translator and there's a bunch of technology and there's a social movement um, and there's capital flows and liquidity flows, and they're absolutely impacted by interest rates. And all, all this stuff is all true. How you sort of translate that into the language of the person that you're speaking with is sort of the challenge that that you have then when you're trying to fundraise. Hmm. Um, tell us about your 2024 roadmap. Are you planning to do any additional raises? Um, we are not, um, and, you know, we normally just per SEC rules, even if we are raising, we can't, um, we can't tell anybody that we're raising. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's because we, it's a bunch of downstream restrictions on the SEC, um, side, but we're registered investment advisors. And so, um, we're, we're constrained in a lot of ways, um, as we should be. Um, and so, um, even if we were, we, we really couldn't say, but, um, but yeah, we're, we're actually, you know, we, we announced the last fundraise, um, that we did and. We're still sitting on a lot of cash and deploying it into great companies, and and um, so yeah, no no plans to raise it anytime soon. Mm. Now, I saw former SEC chair Jay Clayton is an advisor. How did you guys get Jay Clayton? And yeah. uh, I, I want to talk a bit about his views. Has have they changed? It, given mm. you know under his administration, I would say it was much better than it is with Gensler right now. Um, yeah. it, it was by no means perfect, but look, I think all these folks are trying to figure this technology yeah. and this asset class out. Yeah, um, yeah, Jay's been fantastic. Um, Jay. Uh, uh, how are we originally Jay? I believe we met Jay. I don't remember. Maybe through Jay, maybe through Kevin Warsh. Kevin is a former Fed governor. He was actually the youngest um, governor of the Fed. He was um, he was basically uh, Ben Bernanke's right hand guy during the two thousand eight crash, um, and he was like the architect of a lot of the bailout, the, the V one bailouts in two thousand eight to try to like the TARP bailouts and stuff to try to you know save the financial system, mm. which they executed on phenomenally. He ended up leaving, I believe, in 2010 um, after being there for a few years because the, in his opinion, he's sort of like a, he's like a pretty moderate economist. Um, so he's like very anti-modern um, monetary theory, MMT. Um, and his belief was that, and I think he was right in retrospect, his belief was that if we kept doing these stimulus packages, we were on a road to disaster because you would create massive downstream inflation 
yeah. um, and asset uh, price appreciation. And that would be really bad for the average person, um, but also it would really distort the markets. And we didn't really need it. Um, and what we should do is let the markets be the markets. And so it was supposed to be like a one-time thing and we're supposed to be done. And we kept sort of, we kept it going for like a decade. Um, and he was very, very opposed to that. So he ended up leaving in 2010, I believe, and went into the private sector. Um, and he's an advisor to, um, to Electric and he's been phenomenally helpful, just helping us understand his perspective is so valuable. It's just really, really smart. Uh, these days he's, um, he works very closely with Stan Druckenmiller, um, if you know Stan sort of a legendary um, investor. Okay. Um, and so they, they've always just given us fantastic advice. So I, I, I believe um, Kevin introduced us to Jay. Um, to your question around Jay, I think Jay's thinking has evolved on this a lot as it, as it should. And I think he's a really smart guy. Um, I think he understands, you know, even if you look back at his, his positions during his tenure, um, you know, he was very open to the idea that these things would be transformative and that the technology, the underlying technology was going to be transformative to Wall Street and so on. Um, but he was actually quite moderate, especially compared to um, current SEC in terms of how he thought about um, managing these, because I think he does have this perspective that um, you want to have responsible innovation. So I think there, there's sort of one worldview that's sort of on the spectrum. There's like one end of it, which is innovation drives everything, like let it go, don't touch it. All the way on the other end of the extreme is this stuff is really bad. We need to protect people against it. So like be extremely, extremely, extremely cautious about what you let through and why. And it's it, basically you want the, you, you want the system to be permissioned almost is kind of how they think about it. And we and we control the keys and we're going to tell you if you have permission. And I think Jay's, Jay's in the middle, which is like innovation is really important. You just want to be responsible with it. You don't want the retail user to get blown up um, because you were irresponsible with with letting bad things happen. Um, and so I think he's always at his core been pro innovation and, and pro trying to figure this stuff out, which is why, I mean, like the Hinman stuff happened um, with him, right? And he's, he's sort of like, I think, understood that this stuff could have huge, huge implications um, and was always open to it. And I think his, as the space has evolved, as Bitcoin has become more established, as Ethereum kind of established as a decentralized thing, um, he's always been sort of pushing for the applications of these technologies in all sorts of ways and very open to um, the downstream consequences of, of things like Ethereum being fully decentralized and not a security and so on. Um, so I, I actually give him a lot of credit. I don't, I don't think that's, it's it's easy to be inside the government and try to do this balancing act of like, we're pro-innovation, we want these things to, to exist and flourish, um, but do it in a responsible way. And over over time as the ecosystem evolves to evolve your own thinking and say like, actually yeah. things are different today than they were seven years ago. And we should update our, our models because the world is different today. And so I, I give him a lot of credit for, for updating his models. And he pushes a lot of, he's, a, he's um, the chairman of the board at the Apollo group, like the big, big asset manager. Um, and I give him a lot of credit for, for pushing this um, in the Apollo ecosystem as well. He does a lot of stuff behind the scenes to, um, to push push this sort of thinking of like this stuff is really valuable and, and interesting and we should be thinking about incorporating it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you can answer this, but has he spoken to Genser? Is he trying to talk to the current administration about their approach to crypto? I, I don't know. Um, you know, and, and I'm not. Um, I wish I were more versed on politics <laughs> to understand how these things work in terms of like who talks to who and how these dynamics work. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. Um, I mean, I, I think if um, if I were in the administration today, I think, uh, I would be thinking about who has experience with these kinds of issues and, and trying to get their input, no matter where they are on the political spectrum, because I think the reality is, you know, uh, crypto AI, uh, some of the chip manufacturing stuff, um, you know, drone technologies, like there's, there's these handful of technologies that actually have like real geopolitical consequences. And so setting aside where you on, are on the political spectrum, you know, I think trying to get all of the input so you can make a really good decision, either in the executive branch or in the legislative branch, I think the best people tend to do that. Um, and so I hope they are. I think Jay has a lot of good thoughts on this stuff. So before the recording, you mentioned you're heading to the White House, I think next week, and you're doing some um, advocacy and education with members of Congress and so forth. Um, obviously, it's a shit show with the SEC right now. They're losing in the courts. The industry's counter suing them. They're suing the industry. Uh, yeah. We had a bill come out the House, the Fit 21. We're waiting for it to go to the Senate. 
We'll see what happens with the election. Donald Trump says he's the pro-crypto candidate. Biden, we haven't heard anything. We don't even know if Biden's going to be around. But tell yeah. us about the work you're going to be doing uh, next week. Yeah, so I, I do a lot of work on the DC side. So I'm, I'm um, chairman of the board at uh, Crypto Council for Innovation, CCI. Um, it's uh, the leading advocacy group in the, in, in the space. Um, it's us, Andreessen, Coinbase, Paradigm, uh, Fidelity, Block. Um, so relatively small, like high-powered group of people. Um, and so we do a lot of advocacy work behind the scenes. Um, and, and especially with the 2024 elections, there's been a lot of sort of senators and Congress people and people in the executive, uh, you know, staffers kind of coming through San Francisco and I'm going to DC to, to do a bunch of conversations next week as well. Um, and so, you know, a lot of it, it, it is, is, is actually similar to how we approach the LP conversations, which is why I think we have been effective and we have, um, the, the good, uh, fortune of having the access that we do, um, to, you know, we're probably like, uh, you know, on an email or text basis with probably a dozen senators and probably 25 members of Congress and, and some folks inside, um, you know, staff, staffers inside agencies and stuff that, that um, we can speak with. And because our approach has always been, we're not going to try to convince you of anything, but let me just show you the facts. Like I can show you the data about what's happening with software development. And I can show you that the U.S. used to have 60, 65% market share of the open source development that was happening in crypto back in 2016, 2017. Mm -hmm. And today we're down to like 27%. Wow. Um, and that's, in my opinion, not good. If you're, if you're, you know, in an elected official in the United States and your job is to create jobs in the country and to think about where software development is happening and things like cryptography and distributed systems, cryptography is really important. Um, you know, do you want that to be happening in uh, East Asia? Do you want that to be happening in Eastern Europe? Or would you rather have that happen in the United States? Now, I can't like, I'm not going to tell you what to do, but like I can show you the data and the data is very clear on what's happening. Uh, and, you know, I can show you the data on stable coins. I can show you why they work. I can show you who is using them. I can show you the downstream consequences of how much of that might end up in treasury demand. And if you're thinking about uh, the dollar as a national security asset, because now you can do sanctions on people and, and you know you want to monetize the debt and so on, um, I'll just show you the data. You decide if you think it's a good thing or not, but it's very clear if you look at the data, the role that this thing can play. Um, and so that's the approach we've taken. And, and I think as a result, very similar to the LP side, we're, we're not trying to convince anybody of anything. We're just like, I'm, I, I don't, like literally I have no idea how the government works, right? Like, I don't know how a bill becomes a law like, I, you know, I, I study software engineering, but I can show you the data. Uh, and so you guys need to figure out what to do with this. And I think because we take that approach of being nonpartisan, like, I don't really care if you're Republican or Democrat or if you're in the White House or, you know, what agency you're in. I just want, I just want people to make the right decision. Um, that seems to land. That seems to work quite well. Um, and it is, I mean, that's genuine. It's not, we're not trying right. to like run a playbook or something. We just want people to make good decisions. And it's, it would be such a missed opportunity in our opinion, for politics to get in the way of creating better products for end consumers, for creating companies that are more accountable to their customers um, because there's transparency and audibility. I think it'd be a huge strategic missed opportunity um, to have uh, things like cryptographic research move outside the US. Um, and so I think those would just be really big misses. So that's how we talk about it. And, and we've had the good fortune of a lot of people say, you know what, that's actually a very reasonable way to approach it. Like you're not trying to convince me of anything. You're just trying to give me the facts. So I make a good decision. I think that resonates. Yeah, absolutely. And, and look, it, it shouldn't be a partisan issue. Obviously certain people like Elizabeth Warren have made it that. And, yeah, yeah. and, and, that, and that, yeah, unfortunately. And and that kind of is why I think it, it has become so political because the other side is like, you know, what are you guys yeah. doing? Why are you so anti crypto blockchain and so yeah. forth? It's, it's just uh, nonsense. And yeah. then, now I think we're seeing some Democrats waking up because they're working with their colleagues on the Republican side to get some bills through to repeal certain things from the SEC. Yeah. Um, but we'll see what happens this election. It's it's fascinating. I, I, if you told me you know crypto will be an election issue, I, I yeah, I wouldn't pretty have, wild. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's pretty wild. And I give a lot of credit. I mean, I, I do think. There's been a lot of work behind the scenes by folks like CCI, Fair Shake Pack. Fair Shake Pack is now the largest super PAC in the United States. Um, wow. And uh, 
of all packs and it's a crypto pack uh, and you know huge huge credit to ripple and coinbase and andrews norwitz for for putting in 150 million between the three of them 50 million each uh we're, we're very small contributors compared to those guys to that to that thing um but uh you know i think there there's sort of been a lot of behind the scenes work and advocacy work that's been happening for two years and then there was this sort of spark moment where donald trump leaned in hard and said i'm pro and i think that sort of forced a lot of people who were in tough re-election districts to sort of wake up and say wait a second like is this actually a wedge issue like do i want my opponent to be able to take this issue from me um and i think a lot of dems realize that they don't want to give that up given the demographics of who's here it's disproportionately young it over indexes on um, black and brown people, um, you know, over indexes on people who actually have been left out of the existing financial system. So when you look at it on the merits, you're like, why are th- this is like, this is the democratic base. Like, what are you, what yeah. are you doing? And so the smart people sort of sat up and said, okay, we can't lose this issue. Um, and, and now it's sort of similar, right? Like before you could kind of ignore it, kind of like we we're talking about with the, with the foundations before you could ignore it. Now, a lot of, um, people in tough races can't ignore it and they have to take a position on it. And now that's forcing the downstream hand of a lot of other people. Um, but like I said, I think this is really at its core, it's a nonpartisan issue. I think it's really a question of, do you want jobs in the United States? Do you want companies that you know have to, you know, don't own all your data? Do you want um, financial products that don't take fees from, for, from poor people, right? Like you think about the way the banks work disproportionately, how do the banks make money? They make money off of fees. Mm-hmm. I'm not paying any fees. So who's paying ATM fees? It's people who don't have enough money in their bank account. So it's basically money coming from poor people. And so when you start looking at the at the issues, you're like, actually, these are totally nonpartisan issues. Like this should not be politicized. This is like we can make better products for American consumers. Um, and we can lower fees on people and we can keep jobs in the United States and make new jobs. Like this, these are totally nonpartisan issues, in my opinion. Absolutely. Um, I'd love to get your thoughts on the Bitcoin ETF performance of what we've seen so far with the inflows. we got the Ethereum ETF potentially being approved this week, according to Bloomberg analysts. Uh, what are your thoughts on how things have gone so far? Uh, I think um, the Bitcoin ETF has really outperformed. Uh, it it ex- exceeded my expectations. Like I had, you know, I did not expect it to do as well as it did. You know, how is the ETF going to do? I have, I have no idea on, on the ETH side. I, I also think that like, we have to think about these things on very long-term time horizons. I, I, you know, the, the guys at Bitwise have published some data uh, a few times um, referencing the gold ETF. And so if you look at the gold ETF, actually, um, let's see if I can, I'll see if I can find the tweet, actually. I just saw it flow by today, but from uh, Matt Helgen. Matt is there. Um, yeah, I've had Matt on the podcast say, yeah. Uh, oh, quite a few times. Yeah. Um, yeah, he's really great. Oh, here's yeah. The, yeah, here's the tweet. It's like, in 2004, there was $1.5 billion in the gold ETF. In 2005, it was $3.3 billion. 2006, it was 4.8. 2007, it was 5.6. In 2008, it was 11.2. In 2009, it was 19.3. So actually, for like the six years after the launch of the ETF, every single year had more inflows than the prior year. That's how like the, the machinery of the traditional financial markets works. And so um, I would not be surprised if this is actually like now a very, very long-term trend. And so really to evaluate the success of these things, you, you need to be looking on like a five to 10 year time horizon, not a like six month time horizon. And these ETFs are like, right. the Bitcoin ETF is like six, you know, less than six months old. So it's dramatically outperformed what I thought it would be able to do. But also if you look at historically, um, it would not be surprised if actually the vast majority of the inflows are, are yet to come. Yeah. For sure. Uh, and, and I know many of these issuers are going out educating RIAs and wealth managers. So, the, you know, the, it's a process. And, and a, you know, I think you could probably judge it next year, you know, based on, okay, that's right. the past year, how did it perform? Yeah. 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 I think that's right. Um, One more item here before I let you go. Uh, tokenization. I'd love to get your thoughts yeah. on that. And are you guys looking to do any investments on the tokenization side? Um. Yeah, I think tokenization is very interesting. I mean, I think I think of this as generally under the umbrella of this is just better infrastructure to move money and assets and do financial transactions. And eventually, this is going to do to all of the capital markets of the world what the internet did to all of the information markets of the world. And so, you know, it would have been crazy town in 1995 to say, you know what, like, you're going to get all of your news on the internet. You're going to only watch videos on the internet. You're not even going to turn on your TV anymore. Um, all of the communication you do is going to go through your internet devices uh, on your computer and on a little mini computer in your pocket. It would have been, it would have been crazy town, right? Like they, that all this can happen, but it's actually, that's what happened. And I think if you look at it today, I think it's not, it's, it sounds a little bit crazy town to say, you know what? 
Um, you're going to have a wallet, likely multiple wallets on your phone. Most apps will actually have some sort of wallet built in. All of the money movement of the world will shift towards these 24-7 global uh, decentralized crypto networks, uh, primarily on stable coins. Um, uh, and all of the assets of the world, all the financial markets of the world will move to this infrastructure. So bonds and um, securities and derivatives, it's just better infrastructure to create these capital markets. Um, it's cheaper, faster, more transparent, more auditable, everything is better. And so that's just, it, this infrastructure just eats up all of it. And tokenization is one of those. Um, and so um, we think it's just basically at this point is any fintech company. So the way we think about it is actually, it doesn't even, like it's, it's the litmus test basically is what problem are you solving? And if you can solve that problem using this infrastructure, you should probably do it. So I'll give you an example. Um, we invest in a company called Re, which is a reinsurance company. Uh, on the front end, it's just, it's a Cayman Island registered reinsurance company. Um, uh, has the same collateralization ratios, it's licensed in the Cayman Islands, yada, yada. On the back end, they've built it on top of smart contracts. Now this has two really, really important properties. One, compliance gets really easy. You can just tell the Cayman Island regulators exactly how much collateral you have and what your leverage ratios are. And like all the auditing that they need to do is instant, super easy. So they love it, actually. The Cayman Island guys love it. Mm -hmm. I mean, the company loves it. It actually just makes their jobs easier on the compliance front. Two, um, you potentially opened up new capital markets because all of these people that have US dollars on chain are looking for yield. And this is a productive use of those US dollars. If you could make 25% a year underwriting insurance companies for non-catastrophic risk, um, then that's a great place to put capital. And so if you're in Vietnam, if you're in Nigeria, if you're in Brazil, not only can you now get access to US dollars, but you can actually make 20% of your money in US dollars, you're crushing, like you're thrilled. And now you have access to new financial products that you didn't have access to before. And that's just good, good for people. It's productive financial products. Um, is that a crypto company? Yeah, kind of, right? It's, it's actually just a reinsurance business. Um, so that's how we think about it. It's like the, the sort of, you know, the real measure of success here in the same way, you know, like the, the analogy here is there was a time in the 90s, let's say, where you would call yourself an internet company. Mm. And today, if you launched a company, a software business, and you weren't on the internet, people would be like, what are you doing? Like, of course, you're an internet company. Like, what else would you be? Right. Um, or a mobile company. If you're if you're building like a consumer app, there's a time in 2008, 2009, you'd say, oh, I'm a mobile company and I'm, I'm an iOS app and I do this. And today you just say, no, 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 I just I just do food delivery. And of course, you're on a mobile device. Right? right. And so I think that's where we're headed. It's like, of course, you're going to build it on crypto rails. Like there's no other way to do it. It's just a better way to do it. You just happen to be a fintech or you happen to be a social company or you happen to sell digital assets. You're an NFT marketplace company. Um, or your creator economy business because you help creators move all this money around and, and work with their fans directly. Like, of course you do it on crypto rails because there's no other way to do it. Mm, yeah, great point. Um, wrap up questions here for you. First, if you could sure. create your own metaverse, what would the theme be? Oh, what would the theme be? Uh, I don't know. Um, what's, what, have, what have people said before? What's like a theme space, that people have said? Space, deep, uh, deep, Sea ocean exploration. Uh, oh, interesting. Yeah. Oh, I think I would probably, I don't know, actually. I kind of like real life as it is. <laughs> so I don't even know if I would do that. I, I think what I would do is do an overlay of the metaverse into the real world uh, more so than like a separate universe. That makes sense. Um, rapid fire questions. Favorite food? Pizza. Favorite musician or band? Oh, um, I don't know if I have a favorite musician or band. So nobody. <laughs> favorite movie? Uh, I don't actually really watch movies. So no favorite movie. Well, okay. What was the last movie you watched? What was the last movie I watched? <laughs> um, I think I watched uh, Idiocracy. It was probably the last one I watched, which was actually pretty good. Uh, favorite book? Uh, favorite book? Um, I, I would say it's a tie between um, the, the Gita and the Bible because I think they're like the fundamental like substrate that basically the Eastern and Western societies sort of like understand themselves. Mm. And when you're not working at electric capital, what are you doing for fun? Oh, this is what I do for fun. This is literally what I did was I turned my, I turned my hobby into a job. So this is literally <laughs> what I do for fun. <laughs> awesome, man. Avicho, uh, pleasure chatting with you and congrats on all the success and looking forward to the future updates around electric capital. Well, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. It was good to see you.